Welcome to the Mile High Five podcast. My name is Carl Jensen, and I'm here with my host. I'm Doug Huntington. And we have a very special returning guest. Tell us who you are and what you do. <laughs> hey, guys. Good to see you again, Carl and Doug. Uh, I am J.L. Collins. I am the uh, author of The Simple Path to Wealth and uh, the blog by the same name, jlcollinsnh.com. And we have another pretty exciting annou announcement to get to later in the interview. But before we get to that, Jill, I know you're a man of many talents. You worked in the publishing industry. You've written books. You're a, you're an extremely good writer. You've done tons of interesting, cool things. You've biked around Lake Michigan. Can you tell us about something that did not go well, perhaps a job, something that you were bad at? Yeah, well, I, you know, there... There's certainly I've, I've done a lot of things and and some of them with success and some without going going back to my uh, my childhood my teenage years uh, uh, in those days when you turn I was working in a restaurant as a busboy dishwasher what have you when I was 13 but when you turn 16 you could get a job at the food store which paid a lot more money so the day I turned 16 I I went over to the Jewel food store and got hired to bag groceries. And turns out I was really good at bagging groceries. You know, I was fast and careful and all that good stuff. And if you were good at buying groceries, which or bagging groceries, which was the entry level job, they promoted you to stocking shelves. Well, it turns out, for whatever reason, I can't stock shelves. I'm slow. I'm cumbersome. It takes me too long. And and I just wasn't any good at stocking shelves. And nothing that they could do could change that nothing that i could do could change that and i figured they were going to fire me because i was just so bad at stocking shelves but in their infinite wisdom they moved me into the produce department and it turned out i was pretty good at produce so i guess when you have an incompetent yeah just have to keep moving them around until you find something you can actually do did you ever drop like a jar of olives and then you have to get on the intercom like <laughs> clean up on aisle seven? Did that ever happen? <laughs> yeah, well, except you don't get on the intercom because you're the guy who's got to clean it up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I probably dropped, dropped lots of jars of olives and other things, which also didn't endear them to my shelf stocking ability. So I'm not sure if you liked that job or not. And yeah, your job is kind of near and dear to my heart because I grew up in the same area you did. So I'm familiar with Jewel Food Store as well, although I did not work there. I, I played at Kmart and got rejected. So I was, I probably was not Jewel <laughs> material either. But I think everyone should have a bad job in life or something we think is miserable because that encourages, encourages you to work and maybe go to college or whatever and somehow find your way to a good job. Yeah, well, I, I did like all of my jobs. So it's hard to like something that you're not good at. So I, I, I didn't. I didn't like stocking shelves. I liked working at the food store, but I didn't like stocking shelves because I just I just couldn't do it efficiently. <laughs> this sounds like a reality TV part. Maybe if there's a – when the reality people get really desperate for a show and there's like a, one based on a grocery store, you'll be a celebrity bag boy or pineapple stocker or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, the topic of today is real estate, and we'll talk about why that is in a moment. But I, I know you've written about real estate many times, uh, and specifically the dream of American home ownership and why owning a home is not as great as everyone makes it out to be. And I was thinking about this the other day, and I think if memory serves, and you both can help me, but I think the the second Bush, like he even had an initiative like called Everyone in a Home or something like that. So that was one of the goals of our of his presidency to get everyone in a house i uh, and that i you have conversations with people i just had this one with a with a sibling a year or two ago and she's like yeah my my home has gone up so much i'm like well you do know that your home isn't that great of an investment if you had that money in the stock market in an index fund like vtsax you'd probably even have more money and she kind of looked at me strange and she's like no way so i guess Let's open up with that, Jill. Why, why do you think people think a home is this awesome investment in this awesome life goal? Well, you, I mean, you mentioned a moment ago that, that uh, in the early 2000s, it, there was a push to, to get everybody in, in a home. And so the, it's been very much supported by the government, this idea of home ownership. And it does, if you, if you have a citizenry that owns their own home, they have a bigger stake in the system, and and that's an important thing. That goes actually back to the Depression, when there are a lot of people out of work, and 
the government was very afraid of social unrest from that point of view. And, and that's when they made uh, mortgages uh, much more available and, and uh, guaranteed by the federal government and what had you, have you to encourage people to be more engaged in the system. And then there's all this whole mythology of owning your own home is the American dream. And, uh, and for a lot of people, it was really the only path to wealth because they didn't really understand the stock market and it was kind of scary. And, and back in the old days, you know, buying and selling stocks was also extraordinarily expensive. I mean, you had commissions of five or six percent to buy a stock and then five or six percent to sell it. Uh, you know, we worry about about uh, expense ratios on actively managed funds of one percent, which are genuinely horrific. But in comparison to the bad old days. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of reasons that, that home ownership became that sort of that touchstone for, uh, for a couple of generations. And how much do you think the, the industry pushes that since they can make a lot of money and we're talking, you know, the real estate agents, anyone that's financing, I suspect they really want people to buy homes, right? Oh, yeah, there are a lot of vested interests that make money if you buy a home. I mean, real estate agents are obvious ones. Mortgage brokers and banks are obvious ones. But also, you know, uh, Home Depot, uh, you know, stores like that, uh, people, companies that manufacture appliances. Uh, one of the things that makes homes uh, kind of a bad investment in a lot of ways is that it's very rare for somebody to buy a house and not renovate it at some point. I'm looking at you, Carl. Yeah. And, and, and of course, that you know, that's very expensive. I've done the same thing. I have a reputation because of uh, this post I wrote, uh, Why Your House is a Terrible Investment of Being Anti-House. And the new book I have coming out is probably going to burnish that reputation. But I'm not actually anti-house at all. I'm against buying all the hype around houses. Uh, I see houses as an expensive indulgences. And I've owned and lived in houses most of my adult life. So I'm not opposed to them, but I've never been silly enough to think they were an investment. So it's okay to buy a house as long as you know what its place is. Like uh, calling a house an investment is obviously a silly idea. So sometimes it works out, but usually it doesn't. I think I was looking at, this might've been some Phil Schiller thing, but I think houses have appreciated at roughly the rate of inflation since the late 1800s. Is that correct? Have you read the same thing, JL? Yeah, something like that, even even a little less. I mean, the you know, houses have appreciated, uh, you know, maybe one or 2% uh, on average over, over the decades. But the thing is, housing is, of course, very local. And so for some people, houses do much, much better. And for other people, they do much, much worse. So, for instance, you know, where you live uh, in Colorado, uh, housing has boomed because Colorado has become very, very popular. So there are going to be a lot of people who have stories about how they bought a house and it skyrocketed in value. And those are true stories, but they're isolated stories. If you went to Gary, Indiana or Detroit, Michigan, and you talk to people, you would you would hear the other side of that ledger. So, you know, it's it's. Kind of like if you if you have a pot of boiling water and a pot of ice water, you know the average temperature of your water is probably seventy degrees. But if you put a foot in each, it's not going to be a comfortable seventy degrees, right? Yeah, I've got a follow up thought to that. I, I hear people talking about how much their house is appreciated, especially here in Colorado. And usually, the first thing that comes to my mind is, okay, your house is like doubled in the past ten years or whatever. If your money was in VTSAX, it would have doubled in the past four or five years. It's not like this one asset class is appreciating and everything else is staying the same, it seems. We were talking about cars yesterday, Jail, over email and how the Acura NSX has gone up in price. And so has sure. VTSAX. And it, it, you hear about all these NFTs and art investments. I heard another one called Wine, Invest in Wine. So to anyone who thinks their house has gone up, before you brag about it, I would bring up a stock calculator and see what VTSAX has done in the same amount of time and where your money would be if you would put that down payment in the market instead. Uh, well, as the, I say, uh, I, just if I can jump in, the, I think the other way that people fool themselves when it comes to their 
houses. They'll buy a house for $100,000 and they'll sell it for $200,000 and they'll say, wow, I made $100,000, but they ignore the $25,000 kitchen they added to it and the 5% um, in fees that it costs to buy the thing and the 5 plus percent it's going to cost to sell it and all of the real estate taxes you paid while you owned it. And so I, I think you know, I think a lot of the mythology comes from poor arithmetic. Uh, you know, people just don't really account for all of the expenses that are in, involved in owning a house. But there are still times when houses do, you know, very well uh, in particular moments in time and particular locations. And of course, those are the those are the ones that people talk about and brag about. And but then it becomes a mythology that. That all houses do that all the time, and that, of course, is nonsense. So, JL, you said that you've lived in and owned homes most of your life. So, why do that? And I'll just I'll leave it open for you there. So, yeah, why why have you chosen to live in homes versus renting? So there there are a lot of reasons. I I've also rented at various times in my adult life, but. You know, there were some of the reasons to own the home is is it was provided the lifestyle I wanted at that point in my in my life when my daughter was younger, for instance. We were very interested in school systems and you know, we just thought we'd buy a house in in the school system we wanted for that for that purpose. You know, there are uh, there are nice things about owning a house. Uh I've always bought them from what I call a position of power, which means that I never stretched to buy it. I always bought houses that I could comfortably afford. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think I see houses as an indulgence and, and there are a lot of things in life that I indulge in, you know, find restaurants, but I only do it when I can easily afford it. I don't have to eat in fine restaurants to nourish myself and I don't have to own a house to provide shelter. And what I would say for anybody who's striving for financial independence early on in that in that uh, uh, in that journey, that you are probably much better off renting financially and investing in something like a a, a broad based index fund, VTSAX. That's one of the things the new book talks about. Uh, is you know because houses are are by and large they're expensive. You might get lucky and and see it appreciate beyond your expenses, but you know you might not. Yep. And just thinking back to uh, when I bought my first home, which I mean tying it all together, I should have kept renting. I had a a dirt cheap, horrible little basement apartment. It was awful, but I was you know right out of college, so it didn't matter that it was all dingy and smelled like smoke and stuff like that. I cleaned it up a bit, but then I bought an awful house, which was a terrible investment. But the um, the advice that I got from most everyone was, yeah, buy a little bit bigger than you think you need and maybe a little bit of a stretch so you can't quite afford it. Of course, that fits in the incentives from everyone I was dealing with. And right. not, not my own, but of course I listened to the advice and people were like, oh yeah, you're on your way up. You're going to earn more money and it'll be a great idea if you just stretch yourself a little bit. So. Yeah, that, that was, that was very common advice when I, when I bought the very first piece of real estate I ever bought, which is the subject of this book. Uh, that was the same advice I was getting, you know, you're, you're silly to keep renting and throwing your money away and, you know, you should buy and you know, get on the, on the home ownership, uh, path. And, and, um, you know, I didn't, I was young, I was single. I, the last thing I needed was to buy a piece of real estate, but I didn't know that because I, you know, I was, I was a goofy kid and I was just out of college. And so I said, Oh, okay. You know, my, my college roommate banker father is telling, telling us both, we ought to buy something, you know, we ought to buy something. Well, you know, he was giving us advice that probably worked in his generation when index funds didn't exist and you paid five or six percent to buy and then another five or six percent to sell the stock. Yeah. So one last thought I have about real estate is it's kind of similar to an actively managed fund in that the homeowner or the fund holder are <clears throat> going to get rich. It's the people who manage the transaction. In other words, the real estate broker who gets three percent on the buy or sell side and in the case of the actively fund manager, the person who's getting one or two percent uh, 
commission or whatever from the load on the fund. So if you want to get rich with real estate, maybe get involved with the transaction part of it and not the actual ownership part of it. You know, that was that was true in, in the stock market, too. There was I think there was even a book by this title, Where, where Are the Customers' Yachts? And that comes from a, a story where uh, a couple of uh, stockbrokers were walking through through a marina and looking at all the big beautiful boats and the, or no there was a stockbroker walking his customer through the marina looking at the big beautiful boats and the stockbroker saying yeah this big beautiful boat is owned by you know john our partner john and the firm and this one's owned by tom and you know this one's owned by doug and this one's owned by carl and at one point the customer said where are the customers yachts <laughs> 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 yep. I, I do have one final follow up. I I kind of thought that this uh, mythology of real estate was was changing of home ownership. You had written your post. I know Paul Pant had a really great post about how owning yes. a home isn't all it's cracked up to be. Yeah, it was great, like four thousand words. And I felt the tide kind of turning, and then COVID happens, and now there's a feeding frenzy for houses. It seems like it's kind of dying off, but. What do you think the state of it is today? Do you think people have – do you think that's true at all? Do you think the stigma of renting is is diminishing? And uh, yeah, and how do you think COVID affected this whole thing? You know, I'm, I'm kind of an outlier on, on this subject like I am. It, this this question reminds me of the question is, is the whole idea of pursuing financial independence uh, gaining more and more traction? And – a lot of people in our community think it is, and the community has certainly grown. And along with it, you know, that's a community that has different attitudes about homeownership that are more closely aligned to the ones we've been talking about. But it's still a tiny community. I, th I think we're still always going to be unicorns. I think the people who see the value in renting over owning and look at it not as I've got to own all the time, but what what suits my needs best at this moment in my in my life and in my financial journey. Uh, I think those people are always going to be unicorns. And uh, I don't think COVID changed that. I think COVID did uh, probably create a, a real interest in people moving out of cities and into smaller, less dense towns. And, you know, we have this, this uh, beach house, uh, on Lake Michigan. And, uh, you know, when we bought it in 2017, it, you know, prices along the beach here have been going down for a decade, uh, actually. So we got a pretty good deal on it. And there was no sign they were going to turn around. If anything, they were stagnant. Well, <laughs> come COVID, suddenly, you know, everybody wants to, wants to own a vacation house. So the prices have jumped. Um, and when that's nice, but, uh, you know, I, was unexpected and I would never have bought it counting on that. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't think the general, uh, amongst the, the general population, I think most people feel the best thing to do financially is buy a house the moment you can. And to Doug's point to buy the more house than you think you need and that you can really afford to stretch for it. Doug, what made you buy? Uh, what made you buy this house? I guess Doug bought this house pretty recently. What was your thinking? So very, very specifically, we were living in apartments, like just a quarter mile away, and they were starting to convert this nice field that we overlooked into a gravel pit, a gravel mine. <laughs> so they started doing some preliminary uh, probing. So they had these big machines making all this noise, and I work like right next to the window. So it was very loud. And when we first got to the apartment, it wasn't very noisy at all. It was only maybe 25% occupied. So it felt, uh, I guess it just didn't feel crowded or anything. And once they started doing the gravel probing out there, I thought <laughs> we got to get out of here. This is too noisy. And it started to be a lot more populated around there. So, and to, to JL's point, I mean, this, it's indulgent and I like to have stuff and things around and I don't particularly like to live in an apartment situation. Of course we could have rented a house, but that's relatively expensive here. So, and we, we wanted to set up some roots and be here for a little while. So overall it generally made sense and we can afford it. You know, it's, it's going to be okay. And then I can 
accumulate all this junk around here. You can't see all the <laughs> junk, but there's just there's a lot of stuff around here. <laughs> isn't, you, isn't... Know, you, you touched on a couple of interesting things there. One, one of the great benefits of renting, you know, you rent this apartment, it suits your needs, and then suddenly it's there's there's a bunch of construction going outside your window. Well, it's easy to move on. You know, I mean, you just you don't have to sell anything. You just you just pack up and go. Uh, and but your your reasons for buying a house make perfect sense to me, and you kind of thought it through in a rational way, which I'm not sure a lot of people do. So yeah, it's I I, I think you're you're a great microcosm of how to do it correctly. Thank you. Isn't the gravel pit going to be at Costco now? Did they change that around? Or yes, that's right. So the now there's going to be a wonderful Costco, which I wouldn't want to live directly over, but we're still close enough where I can bike over to the Costco if I choose to, or even walk. I mean, it'll be very close, but we'll get the benefit of having it very, very convenient, but not living basically in the parking lot of the Costco. <laughs> You've lost the opportunity to have a view of a Costco out your window. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's beautiful. I'm kind of jealous. Dollar fifty hot dogs. You could have. Let's see if that's three bucks a day. You could have eaten like what is that for ninety dollars a month? You could have had a Costco hot dog, and they give you the the drink with it like twice a day for every day. I, I don't think you'd be alive that long. But. I I was gonna say I maybe can get my bike, put a cart on it, load it up with hot dogs and diet cokes, and drive up to your neighborhood and deliver it for you. When when the new Costco opens, we'll buy some and we'll have a uh, live hot dog tasting on the. <laughs> Well, high five at the hot dog episode. I don't know if he's serious. I realize you guys were into health food. <laughs> yeah, we, we do intermittent fasting, but we only eat hot dogs after that. We have a feeding window between six and whatever. Yeah. Add samples if, if they have taquitos or maybe even a churro every once in a while. We'll, we'll split the churro. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about your new book. This is pretty exciting because you wrote one of the most highly regarded, most uh, biggest selling books in the financial independence and in the money realm, The Simple Path to Wealth. And now you have, I don't know if a follow-up is the right word because this is a different topic, but tell us the title of the new book and what it's about because it's a vastly different format. And I think it's pretty cool. It's a very fun read. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you enjoy it. It is it is definitely a departure from the simple path to wealth. So one of the things that has me nervous is a lot of people, because the simple path has been so well received, have been eagerly awaiting my second book. And Simple Path came out in 2016, so it's been a while. I'm afraid that some of those people are going to be disappointed, especially if they're expecting Simple Path 2.0, because this is a very, very different project. It's called How I Lost Money in Real Estate Before It Was Fashionable. It's uh, uh, designed to be an engaging, entertaining, humorous tale, humorous at my expense, while teaching some important lessons about the real estate and how easy it is to lose money in it. The, you know, all of what we hear is, is the wonderful stories about how easy it is to make money in real estate. Well, this is different. It's also... Uh, magnificently illustrated and i can say that without sounding arrogant because i didn't do the illustrations i i can't draw stick figures but uh nicolette who was our illustrator uh, just did an incredible job so uh it's going to be a i think a visually stunning book the cover uh a woman named jess uh, designed the cover i think is one of the coolest looking covers i've seen on any book anywhere so um, I think it's going to be visually stunning. I think it's going to be a fun, humorous story. Uh, but it's definitely not Simple Path 2.0. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a contradiction or the opposite because the Simple Path told people what to do, how to invest. And this is more of a tale of what not to do. Yeah. And this, this, is, this is the tale of the first piece of real estate I ever bought, which was a condo in Chicago when the condo market, this is like 40 years ago, when the condo market was red hot and then subsequently collapsed, uh, you know, it's a tale of somebody making every possible mistake uh, that you can make as you go along, including backing into being uh, uh, making it a rental and becoming a landlord. Uh, the first chapter of, of the narrative is entitled Impossibly Naive, which <laughs> gives you a little bit of an idea. And that's describing me because I certainly wasn't possibly naive in those days. 
What made you take on this project? I've heard other authors mention that they just can't get the idea out of their head and they have to write it down just so they can move on with their life. So what, what drove you to write this book? Yeah. So I, I, I've had this, I've had this in the back of my mind for a long time. I, I first wrote the story of this condo, this, this, uh, condo debacle on, on the blog. I mean, way back when, and, uh, I've, you know, it was very painful at the time, but I've, I've learned to see the value of the lessons that I learned in going through. It was an expensive education, but it was a worthwhile one. I've learned to see the value of those lessons. And I've also importantly learned to see the humor in, in, in what I did to myself. So I, I wanted to do it, and I, I knew it, it, it would be fun. I, I knew it would be fun for me to do. Uh, I think it was going to be fun for the reader because it is an entertaining story, and it was fun to go out and find the illustrator and, uh, you know, choose the illustrations and develop. And so it was, it was kind of a fun project. Um, the simple path to wealth was very gratifying to do, but it wasn't fun to do. It was, it was a lot, a lot of work. And, and, uh, and this one has been a lot of work too, but it's been, I think it's just been more, more fun because it maybe just cause it's a, as a lighter tone, maybe because it's my second and, you know, I'm a little more relaxed about doing it. And I mean, I'm curious if you have any sort of benchmarks that will tell you, Hey, this is successful or <laughs> are you taking it a little easier? And you don't have to answer that specifically, but I'm curious how you're deeming it a success or not a success mm -hmm. or anything like that. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I, you know, I, I, because it's illustrated and, and, you know, I, because of both the professional help I've engaged in creating it, uh, I, you know, I've got, a, it's a pretty good price tag on having created this thing. And so I guess my first level of measure of success is, will it, you know, will it, will it earn back that money? So I'm not out of pocket having done it. I, I don't, anticipated being as successful as the simple path to wealth just because that's that one to my amazement it just has has been a phenomenal success and i think it has more universal utility and appeal maybe whereas this one is a little more entertaining now i i, I don't know i might be surprised it might turn out that people prefer entertaining and this one will sell just as well or even better but you know, my my guess is that it'll sell maybe a hundred thousand copies, and that would be a quarter of what the Simple Path to Wealth has done. So, and a hundred thousand copies is a phenomenally successful book, as books go. But, but so I think it's a pretty modest modest goal given given its big brother. Yeah. So we talked a little bit before about why people buy homes, what made you want to buy this condo way back when? And what, remind me, what neighborhood was it in, in Chicago, being that we're both from there? So yeah, I forget what the the neighborhood is called, but it's it's right, if you, if anybody knows Chicago, it's where Devon comes and hits Sheridan Road. It's that S bend on Sheridan Road, just south of there is where it is, just south of Loyola University. Um, I think that might still be Rogers Park, because Rogers Park is where my apartment was when I bought, which is a little bit to the north, but it might have a different name. But uh, yeah, it was on, on Lake Michigan. The building itself was on Lake Michigan. My condo didn't have a view of Lake Michigan to face the courtyard because at the time I, I bought it, all the ones that overlooked the lake had been taken. But the reason I, you know, I was, it was a perfectly content, happy renter. And uh, I came back from a trip to Florida uh, one day in January of uh, 79 and my college roommate, uh, called me almost the moment I walked in the door. Now you gotta remember this is long before cell phones and even answering machines. So if you weren't around to pick up your phone, people just had to call back. So he was all excited. Where have you been? And I've been trying to reach you and blah, blah, blah. And Cause he, he, he was hot to buy something. In fact, he and I had actually talked about buying a two flat together and he'd live in one unit and I'd live in another unit. And we went to see a realtor about it who convinced us 
erroneously looking back on it, we didn't have enough money to do that. That would have been a much better investment, I think, than the condos we went up buying. But anyway, he'd found this old courtyard building on the lake that was being gutted inside. And the, the idea was they were going to build um, basically new apartments in this stately old building. And that kind of appealed to me. And and of course, then as now, you know, the common wisdom was, of course, you buy. You know, that's that's the you know, that's the sensible thing to do. That's the path to improving your financial situation. You know, renting is throwing money away. And to give you what I say, I was impossibly naive. Think about this. My rent was one hundred sixty five dollars a month. Uh, and it was a studio apartment. The condo was one bedroom, so the condo was a little, little bigger, and and it was newly renovated, so it was a little newer and fancier, I guess. But I paid forty five thousand dollars for it, and the principal and interest was roughly three hundred and seventy dollars uh, for that, and then the assessment was a hundred bucks, and then because of all the things that the developer didn't do, we ladled on a special assessment uh, within a year of another hundred dollars. So now my monthly nut goes from $165 to $570. Wow. And I was perfectly content in, in my studio apartment. It was very, it was a nice apartment. It met all my needs. Unlike, you know, the, the place that Doug described, which sounded pretty awful. Uh, the, you know, the, the first one you were, you were describing in the basement, um, you know, this one, I was perfectly content there. And yet somehow just because of the madness of crowds around me, I, I, I didn't even think about those numbers in a rational way. I just said, Oh, of course I'm going to buy a condo. Of course, $370 is okay. Even though I've only been paying 165 of course there's going to be a hundred dollar assessment of course there's going to be a, another one that brings it up to 200 I, I mean it's just you know it was it was just being impossibly naive and uh and i was and i think a lot of people when they first get in the real estate uh inferred by their first real estate are because they're they're following that erroneous common wisdom that yes this is is always a good thing to do, and it will always profit you. Yeah, the numbers are staggering. That your assessment was more than your entire rent. Like, holy crap! Oh. Well, here, here's an even here's an even more staggering thing. So when I when I uh, when I, I a couple of years later I bought a two flat, and which turned out to be a much better investment because I was a lot wiser at that point and, and smarter about how I bought it. But in any event. So I was moving out of the condo and the condo market had collapsed. So selling it was, was a non-starter. The bank had taken over after the developer fled and sold units like mine for 20 to $24,000 where I had paid 45. So I was kind of stuck with this thing. And um, so I rented it and I rented it for $375. It, you know, it's amazing to me when I, when I look at the comments in my, on, on my post of why your house is a terrible investment, I get people defending houses saying, well, you know, it has to be a better investment than renting because, you know, landlords charge rent to cover all their expenses and to make a profit. So obviously you're better off owning. Well, landlords don't get to set the rent. The market sets the rent. I mean, if I could have set the rent, I would have set it at $600 and made a little bit of money, but nobody would have rented it. The going rate for a unit like that one was $375. And that meant that I was hemorrhaging every month $195. So now I am on this, what's become an investment, I am hemorrhaging $30 a month more than my rent in my in my, my nice, comfortable studio apartment has been, just in the loss. <laughs> so and that yeah. sounds so uh, maybe that's why I'm hard to persuade that, that that owning is better than renting all the time. Yep. And I was going to say, unfortunately, that parallels exactly the home that I bought, where at some point, uh, well, I bought in 2005. So the, the market dropped like, whatever, a couple of years later. So I was renting it out and losing hundreds of dollars per month until I realized, 
you know what? I, I'm better off just running away from this thing. So another story for another day. But yeah. JL, I wish you would have written the book a few years sooner. I maybe could have saved <laughs> uh, saved some money, headaches. So you said when you came back from Florida, you were considering buying a Porsche and you bought the condo instead. <laughs> a- after you were knee deep in shit in this condo, every time you saw a Porsche go by, did you like curse life? And I could have had that. And instead of dealing with all this crap, I could have been on Lakeshore Drive with my 911 or whatever you were going to get. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think I could have afforded a 911, but they had, I, I think the uh, the front engine one had just come out. And again, this is the is the early 80s. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I think about if I was going to piss money away, I, at least I could have enjoyed driving the thing around. The other thing I do in, in the book is at the end of it, I calculate what my total losses were between what I hemorrhaged every month for so long. And then of course, at one point I could no longer rent it. I couldn't even find somebody to rent it at all. So now I'm not hemorrhaging $195 a month. I'm hemorrhaging $570 a month. And that went on for 16 months before I finally managed to unload the stupid thing. So anyway, I total all of that up. I total up the loss that I took on the sale because I, even though I was selling it, I think eight years, seven, eight years after I bought it, I still couldn't sell it for what I paid for it. And uh, so anyway, I total all those things up and then I go to the calculators and calculate what that, 26,000, roughly $26,500 would have grown to if I'd put it in an S&P 500 index fund for 35 years. And the depressing answer is over a million dollars. <laughs> so, oh, Is that condo worth a million dollars right now, do you think? Or have you ever gone back and zoloed it? You know, I did go back and, and look at it and uh, is in preparation of doing this book because I wanted to find a photo of the actual building for my cover designer uh, to, you know, to to use as a in rendering the image of it. And, uh, I, you know, I think they're, they're selling the units like mine, from what I could tell, are selling for about one hundred seventy five, two hundred thousand dollars today. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And this, we're talking 40 years. So not good. One other thing that cracked me up about the book is you, you were in the fight against the developer. You called it, I think you referred to yourself as a, as a gorilla in the fight as a gorilla <laughs> movement. <laughs> not the <gorilla> warfare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's rough. I mean, when I hear gorilla movement, I think of uh, some kind of war going on in a third world country, but you were engaged in this against your developer in your condo. Well, the, you know, the, the good the good thing about that is that it, it, you know, there's nothing like adversity to, to band people together. So all of those, all of us who had been, this building had 58 units. So all of us that had been silly enough to buy uh, were fighting the same battle. And so we became a pretty tight, tight knit community. And, and then of course, when the developer fled the country, which he did, uh, you know, then he left the building undone and it felt us to figure out how to finish the common areas. The bank, as I say, took over and auctioned off the, the, uh, apartments that, that were still unsold. So the building finally got sold completely, but then, you know, as, as the condo association, we had to figure out how to raise the money and to finish all the common areas, which had been left undone. And, so, but, you know, it's certainly, you know, just like any guerrilla movement, I guess it, it creates a certain camaraderie. It's not, it's not fun. It's not easy. And it's, it's painful, but there is camaraderie and pain, I guess. Right now I'm picturing jail, like in some camouflage thing with like the Che Guevara, whatever that, <laughs> with the, what that had on with that, that, that famous it, pose that, that could have been the front you know, artwork for your book too. <laughs> You know, I, if I thought of that, I might have thought of that. What, what, what you will see, because I do have an image of me as, as a revolutionary soldier from, <laughs> from the American Revolution, but the, the one you described would have been equally fun. <laughs> <laughs> Man, did you ever hear from YP again? And that was how you referred to the developer. You said he went back to his home country or maybe, yeah. some, maybe something worse. Did he ever reappear in your life or was that it? No, oh, he, he disappeared forever, and, and the rumor was that we walled him up in the basement and 
That's another one of the illustrations is me walling <laughs> up in the basement. Uh, that, of course, is, is there's no truth to that. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, okay. it's a great Chicago tradition. But, you, know, <laughs> you should don't, don't, go break, don't go to this building and break into any walls. There's, that doesn't benefit anybody. You should uh, you should find him, and then when you do a book tour, you could take him on for the book tour, and you and him could both sign the book, and you could have like a little debate. <laughs> I think that'd be fun, or not. <laughs> Maybe it could yeah, cause some PTSD for you. Yeah, or not. Yeah, we were. Uh, I was not his favorite person by the time this he left, and the feeling was mutual. <laughs> So you had to become an unwilling landlord, as lots of us had to do. This actually happened to us, too, uh, almost with a condo in Chicago because uh, we bought yeah. one in the 2000s, and then the whole thing went down the shitter. You've always <laughs> got the sunk cost, of, or you're anchored on the price you bought it for, and I need to get more than that. And then there's the transaction costs, which we previously talked about. So we're like, screw it. We'll just become a, a landlord. How did landlording for you go? You referred to it a little bit as it was a gator. You were losing money every month by... <laughs> it was that your first landlord experience? I know you later bought the two flat. Yeah, no, this was my this was my first uh, ownership experience, and then my first uh, my first experience with with a rental real estate. That's why I learned the term alligator. You know, it, because once you you know once you start owning investment real estate, rental real estate, then at least then I started educating myself, and I learned that. That rentals that that are cash flow negative uh, are so common uh, because people like me do stupid things that they act, there's actually at least back in those days there was a term for it they called it an alligator because it was slowly eating the investor alive and that's another illustration in the book by the way and, and yeah I never intended to invest in real estate I I was buying this condo that I thought you know, was going to be a piece of cake and the developer was going to handle everything the way he was supposed to. And, and it was going to appreciate massively in value and make me money instead of throwing my money away on rent and all that nonsense. And, and the next thing I knew I was a landlord and not only a landlord, but I owned an alligator as we talked about that was hemorrhaging $195 a month. And by the way, if that doesn't seem like much, remember we're talking 40 years ago, so, you know, you're talking like $1,500 today. And uh, so it was it was ugly, but but you couldn't sell it. I mean, when the bank has just sold units just like yours for $24,000 and you paid forty five dollars for yours, unless you're willing to eat, uh, you know, a, a, a huge loss. And, of course, I couldn't afford in those days to do that because I had a $40,000. I owed the bank $40,000. So if I'd sold it, I had I would have had to come up with sixteen thousand dollars just to get out from under it. And again, you know, if that doesn't sound like a lot of money, remember you got forty years of inflation to. And I actually provide a chart in the book showing the inflation adjusted numbers for people so they can they can relate to it. And I forget what what forty thousand uh, inflation adjusted to today's dollars is offhand, but it's a lot. So. Did you ever consider just walking away from it? Did people do that back then? You know, I uh, people did do that back then, and I did consider it. But um, if you're going to walk away from it, well, first of all, I have an ethical problem with doing that personally. Um, but secondly, I also I had other assets. You know, I was investing in in stocks and mutual funds at the time, so I had you know other assets that were successful, and of course. If you're going to walk away, you better not have any other assets because obviously if you have assets, they're going to come after you. So the only way you can walk away is if you have no assets. And I was not in that position. But even if I was, again, I have an ethical problem with, you know, it wasn't the bank's fault I did made stupid decisions. So, you know, walking away and leaving them on the hook would not have felt right to me. How many years total did you end up owning this thing for? Let's see. I, I I entered into the contract to buy it in January, February of 79. Uh, didn't actually move into it until around October of that year because it took them a long time to get it finished. Uh, and then I sold it at the end of 86. So I 
think in terms of actually closing it, I probably owned it for seven years, but the journey itself began a year earlier, roughly. So, you know, I was, I was tied to this thing for about eight years. <laughs> what wow. was the first thing you did after you went away from the closing table? Do you remember, did you go out a deep dish pizza or have a beer somewhere? I, I celebrated till my eyes bled. <laughs> wow. It was, it was one of the, the happiest days of my, of, of my life. There was, I had, I had left Chicago at that point. But because we'd fought this guerrilla war with the developer, I was pretty close friends with the other owners, including the guy who was the president of the association. And one day, and this again, remember, this had been sitting empty now. I couldn't even find a renter for it. So it had been sitting empty for uh, over a year, hemorrhaging 570 bucks a month. And and so this was a real pain point for me. And I, I shamefully, I don't remember this guy's name, but... Uh, one day, uh, a woman approached him and she said, yeah, are there any units for sale in this building? And and he said, well, I do know a guy who'd, who could be persuaded to part with his. <laughs> and he put us in, in contact. It turned out that the reason she was interested in the building was her boyfriend lived in the building. And moreover, uh, the unit he happened to own shared a wall with the unit I owned. So not only was it the building she wanted, but as it turns out, my apartment was just about the most perfect one for her in, in the building. And, uh, but unfortunately for me, she wasn't a dummy. And, uh, so <laughs> in, in the negotiation, she said, how much do you want for it? And I said, well, you know, I paid 45,000 for it. And I know they haven't appreciated it, but I could probably let it go for 45. And she promptly offered me 35. And again, at 35, you know, now I still owe the bank 40 grand because there hasn't been that much time passed. But I'm thinking, you know, I, I'd be willing to, to get out from under this thing. I'd be willing to reach into my pocket for the extra five grand. So at 35 grand, I know that I'm going to do a deal with this woman. But we went back and forth a little bit and, and she actually uh, paid 40, which got me out from under the uh, and there were no realtors involved, so I didn't have to pay commissions, which was a good thing. But that actually provided me the money I needed to pay off the bank and, and walk away uh, w with only the money that I had hemorrhaged, you know, at that point without having to dig into my pocket any further. But then, of course, the IRS came and, and pointed out that I owed them a capital gain. <laughs> and I would do tax on the capital gain. <laughs> and I said, you're laughing because you both invest in real estate. So anybody who invests in real estate can see where this story is going. But I, but I was naive. What are you talking about a capital gain? I paid 45,000 for this thing. I got a capital loss of $5,000 and the IRS said, well, no, no, no. You know, you have a basis in this, in this, uh, condo of $25,000. And you sold it for forty, so you have a capital gain of fifteen thousand. How are you figuring that? Well, the way they're figuring that is, I had been taking depreciation, and and when you're hemorrhaging the amount of cash that I was hemorrhaging, you're grasping at any straw you can. And in those days, you could take something called accelerated depreciation. I don't think you can anymore, but so I was I was also doing that, and that softened the blow, the hemorrhaging year by year, but I didn't really fully understand. It was also reducing uh, the amount of money that would ultimately be my basis when I sold it. So that's how you wind up buying a condo for $45,000, selling it for forty, a $5,000 loss, and paying a capital gains tax on $15,000. <laughs> oh, man. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> rough, but... In a kind of funny sort of way, your life has come full circle because right now you live on Michigan. You're just up the lake a little bit. Have you ever thought about that? Oh, that's true. I yeah, I am on. I I actually I haven't thought about that in in particular. But yeah, I'm I'm back living on the lake in much happier circumstances. Yeah, <laughs> but then I'm not impossibly naive anymore. <laughs> Yeah. What would you tell a young person? Uh, I, I know you've written the post. I know you've written this book. What would you tell 
a young person, what would you tell yourself, I guess, your naive young self, if you could tell your young self something, um, what would you do to try to dissuade them or encourage them to make a better decision? Well, I mean, in terms of my, my young self back in the day, if I could well, of course, if I if I rerun the clock, I wouldn't have this story and I wouldn't have this book. So maybe ultimately the the horror story I just described is 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 going to be worth it. But uh, you know, if I if I knew then what I knew now, I never would have. I left my apartment. I would have kept. You know, I would have kept. I was perfectly happy there, and it was dirt cheap, and I was investing in 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 the stock market, which was doing well for me, and you know, I, I'd be much, much wealthier if I'd never bought this stupid thing and just kept putting my excess money into, into, uh, into, into my other investments. You know, what's interesting is, is I lived in this building for several years and it was owned by three Croatian brothers. And I was a really good tenant because, you know, if you're smart, you're going to be a good tenant because good tenants are precious to landlords at least to smart landlords. And uh, so anyway, these guys liked me and I liked them. And But even when I told them I was leaving because I was going to buy a condo, even they were like, yeah, you know, we hate to lose you as a tenant, but, you know, it's really a good thing that you're buying something. And, you know, it's a really a smart move. And, and so, yeah, but yeah, my advice would be, I mean, my advice counter to what some people think isn't don't ever buy real estate or don't ever buy a house or don't ever buy a condo. My advice is don't buy into the hype surrounding those things. Go into it with your eyes wide open. Learn how to do basic arithmetic and run the numbers before you make the decision. And by the way, you might run the numbers and discover that owning is going to be more expensive than renting. In fact, I think that's probably going to be a pretty common result. That doesn't mean that you can't buy. It just means that you now understand the price that you're paying for making that lifestyle decision. So if I'd run the numbers back in the day, I, you know, there's no way if I really had understood what the numbers would have told me that I would have given up living for $165 and being perfectly content to paying $570. I mean, that's the very definition of insanity. But even if I'd wanted to do that, at least then I knew what, what the what the numbers were telling me the premium I was going to pay for that, and of course, if you want to buy and you run the numbers and it turns out as it sometimes does that it's actually cheaper than renting, well, now you get to do what you want to do and save money. Very good. And I just want to go back. You said you owned the house for about seven years and the condo. <laughs> or sorry, yeah, the condo for seven years, and it sounded like pretty pretty quick you knew that it was not going to be a fun situation and then it kept kept on for a few years how soon was it because obviously when you first like when you heard about the you know quote opportunity that you had you were probably very excited and thinking wow this is really an amazing thing i'm going to be able to do and then the wheels fell off how soon did the wheels fall off well, let me start off. Let me, let me start, Doug, by re, by commenting on the last part about I thought it was amazing. I didn't really have any enthusiasm about buying this thing. You know, I was again, I was perfectly content running. It's just that everyone around me, including my old college roommate who was who bought in the same building, and his father who was a banker, everyone around me was saying this is the smart move. This is the smart thing to do. And I thought, well, I you know, I don't particularly care one way or the other, you know, I, I mean, I like where I live. I like my apartment, but if this is a smart move, well, okay. So I didn't really have any great enthusiasm for it. So I didn't even get to have that benefit. And then, you know, again, I, I signed the deal to buy it in uh, January, February of 79 and it was under construction. So when I bought it, it was just, it was a gutted shell. And, um, uh, it was supposed to be done in August. And one of the impossibly naive things is I never checked. I mean, I'm sure you're laughing at me now because you guys know in any construction pro project, you know, rule number one is pay attention to what's going on. But I didn't do that. And so, you know, literally I, I looked at this thing, I signed the papers 
And then I didn't come back until August 1st when I thought, well, maybe I go back and see how it's coming. It should be pretty done by then. They hadn't even begun. They hadn't even touched it. And, and of course, my lease is about to run out at, at, in the not too distant future. And, and, and by the way, here's a, here's a benefit of being a good tenant is I went to my landlords and said, Hey, you know, I, this, there's no way this place is going to be done when my lease is up. Can I, can I continue to stay rent month to month? And they were like, yeah, sure. No worries. If I'd been an asshole tenant, you know, they would say, no, sorry, buddy, <laughs> you're over. Um, so anyway, the, the, the nightmare on this thing started almost immediately and it just kept changing in character. So the first nightmare was trying to get the developer to actually finish the silly thing. Uh, and then when that happened, the second nightmare of it, of it, uh, uh, costing me so much more than my rental had cost me begins. And then the third nightmare is when I decided it was time to move on when I bought the two flat and I could only rent it for $375. So now I'm hemorrhaging that $195. So that's, that's the next nightmare. And then the nightmare after that is when after a few years, I couldn't even rent it. And then I'm hemorrhaging the $570 a month uh, totally. And then the nightmare that coincides with that is the fact that the real estate market was so bad in Chicago at the time by then. And it had been red hot, by the way, when I signed on the dotted line to buy this thing. The real estate market had turned to become so bad that I couldn't even get a real estate agent to take the listing. Hey, you think about that. I mean, you know, real estate agent could take the listing and do nothing else. And then if by some fluke it sold, they'd get paid. I couldn't even get a real estate agent to do that. That's how bad the market was. Wow. So, yeah, you know, and then of course the, the next nightmare is when it finally sells it, I take a loss on it. And then the final nightmare is even having taken a loss on it. I, get to pay a capital gains tax of three thousand dollars <laughs> so, so yeah there's it's it's that's what makes it the entertaining book that it is <laughs> <laughs> that's rough when we interviewed you for the simple path to wealth we talked about the simple path to wealth musical which i think doug is still is still composing the score for doug for the for this musical, uh, I think you have to focus on minor chords, the the sad chords, the sad keys, perhaps. <laughs> but uh, Plus so, violins, <laughs> yeah, violins, the ominous music. I'm thinking of the Godfather music a little bit. But uh, if this was a musical or movie, who would play the villain, Jail? Who would play YP, the developer who disappeared? Oh, wow, that's a tough question. I had, I had who would play. You know, you, you know the guy. I can't think of his name because I don't know actors very well. But there's there's a character actor who's in a lot of things. He was in in uh, was he in Fargo? But he's kind of a weaselly looking guy. Steve Buscemi, maybe or yeah, I would. I don't know that I would even know his name if you said it. But he's in a lot. He plays a lot of not villains, but kind of weaselly yeah. guys, sort of sort of incompetent criminal. Yeah. Sorts of, you know, and I, I can visualize him perfectly, but he would, yeah. Okay. Whoever whoever that actor is, he'd get, he'd get the role as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> of course, Brad Pitt would play me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just because there's such a close resemblance already. Right. Indeed. Yeah, the young JL. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking maybe Thanos from those, uh, like he's the main villain in those comic book <laughs> movies. Like he would play the landlord, then he would just disappear into the night. Yeah. Uh, so, JL, when does the book come out and where can listeners purchase it? Well, I'm not exactly sure. It should be out sometime in the first half of November. And I'm self publishing it like I did with The Simple Path to Wealth. And we're going through uh, Amazon and Ingram Sparks, which will get it into bookstores or at least. Uh, bookstores will have it available. I, you know, whether or not they'll put it on their shelf is another question, but you can certainly go into the bookstore and, and ask for it. But, and you can, you know, go on Amazon and buy it like you buy the simple path to wealth. By the way, the simple path to wealth is also now, uh, published through Ingram sparks in hardcover, which you can get, uh, theoretically you can get it from Amazon. Some people have told me that they click on the Amazon link for it and they're told it's not available, but you can go to any bookstore chain and, they probably won't have it on the shelf necessarily, but they could certainly 
order it for you if you ask. So, yeah. Very good. Yep. And we'll put links so folks can get to the book easily and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, are you going to do any other promotional uh, events? Are you going to do a tour at all? I know you, there's rumors you might be coming to our neck of the woods. If you did, it would be lovely to have an event around this. But if not, it's fine too. Well, you know, I, I, I don't have I don't have a book tour per se planned. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm probably going to do a lot of interviews like this, or at least I hope to, hope to. Uh, from people, you know, I sent the book around to a lot of the people I know in the FI community asking them, as I did you and Mindy, to write blurbs about it. And they were very kind to do it, so I'll be reaching out again. Of course, you've we've already done this interview, but I'll be reaching out saying, hey, if you want to talk about the book on your blog or have me on your podcast, I'd love to do it. But uh, November 1st, this coming Monday, we are returning to our nomadic ways, and, and uh, we'll be making our way back out west and southwest for you know the next seven eight months we'll be roaming around and if you wanted to do an event uh, we will be in colorado in december uh in fort collins actually but that's not all that far from longmont and if you wanted to do an event i that that'd be awesome but you know, the purpose of our travels is not a book tour necessarily but if anybody along you know out out that way uh, is interested in organizing an event, I would love to hear about it and be happy to, happy to do it. But that's not, it is not a formal book tour. Sure. You, you're just trying to get where it's warmer, right? Yeah. Well, I'm just, we're just trying to get where it's warmer and we, we are basically nomadic. We have this beach house here, which is where we've been for the last year and a half because COVID, but, um, uh, and it derailed our nomadic travels. Actually, we were in Denver when COVID hit in the spring of 2020. And, and uh, so we're kind of picking up on that, on that trip and, and, uh, you know, going back to our nomadic ways, but, uh, yeah. Cool. cool. You have many, many friends out here and fans. So when you do come, we will have an event. We will talk about that offline later. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'd love to. I'd love to do that. And one of the reasons that we like being nomadic is we get to see new places. We get to go back to places that we like, uh, that we've been to before, and we have friends in a lot of these places, like yourself. So, yeah, that'd be awesome. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thanks, JL. We really appreciate it, and we'll put links to get to all your stuff. And um, yeah, hopefully, we'll see you soon. Yeah, it's it's my pleasure. I'm I appreciate the invitation to to join you and and if you put a link to the blog when the book is out, uh, you know, just like the Simple Path to Wealth has an ad on the blog, uh, you know, I think I'm going to push that ad down and we'll put the cover of this book up. So if people are interested, maybe the easiest thing to do is go to the blog and then from there get the link and and it should be easy to find. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.